In the previous video, I created a drop-in equivalent for the Altair cassette interface that ran at 1200 baud instead of 300 baud. Now, as far as Altair software is concerned, it looked identical to the original cassette interface, so there's absolutely no changes in any of the Altair software or the way you did things that had to be done in order to use the new cassette interface. The only difference you'd notice, of course, is that things ran four times as fast as before. So for example, instead of taking four minutes to load a program from cassette or 12 minutes from paper tape, it would now load in a minute. And of course, this is a great improvement. It also begs the question, how much faster could we make this run? What is the maximum reliable data rate that we could get out of one of these portable cassette recorders? And that's what this video is gonna be about today. Now, if you haven't watched the previous video, I'd really recommend watching that first. To make that easy to find, I put a link to it in the description of this video. The cassette interface that I created is a two-board set, just like the original Altair cassette interface. It consists of a serial interface board that plugs into the bus, this is what software actually talks to, and then a modem board that takes serial data from this board and converts it into the tones that are read and written to and from tape, of course. Now I've gone into detail about what these boards are and other boards that can be used in previous videos. So again, if you want to learn more, please go watch those. But what we're going to look at now is how do we get this combo to work at a higher baud rate. As far as the serial interface board goes, that's trivial, of course, because it's designed to run at several standard baud rates all the way up to 9600 baud. So that'll just be a matter of changing some jumpers. So the tricky part is making this modem board and the cassette player itself work at higher baud rates than the 1200. Now this cassette interface board, really there's not much to it other than this little PIC microcontroller that's right here. The rest of the parts on there are just really level translation. We have something that converts to RS-232 levels, and then these few passives by the audio jacks are to reduce the output voltages down to the microphone level for recording, and then to limit input voltages so that we don't exceed the uh, plus and minus rails on the microcontroller. My goal is to keep it that way. So in other words, I don't want to add any external signal processing or add new hardware onto this board. I want to make it just firmware changes to this little PIC controller. So that will be the one restriction I put on myself going forward. In order to get 1200 baud out of the cassette interface in the last video, we used two frequencies to tape, 2400 hertz and 1200 hertz, which sounds like it would be FSK, but it's not. Instead, what we're detecting is zero crossings in the positive direction. That's all these points I'm clicking right now. So positive going to zero crossings. And if you consider those to be pulses, you would see this pulse train you see down here. Uh, we get a pulse at the start of every single bit cell. That could be considered a clock. It's going to, whoops, it's going to occur every single bit cell for us. Now, if between a two of these clock pulses, we get a, an additional pulse in the middle, that's going to be a data one. If in the middle there is no pulse, then that's a data zero. Now this might look familiar to you because this is exactly how floppy disks were recorded in the early days. This is the single density floppy format. They called it FM. Not traditional frequency modulation, but yeah, this was the FM format written to single density floppy disks. All right, so how could we increase the uh, baud rate on this? Well, if we just increase the frequencies, we are increasing uh, the baud rate on this, decreasing the time per bit. Uh, the next available baud rate on the serial board after 1200 is going to be 2400 baud. So let me bring up this chart. It looks 100% identical. The only difference is now the bit time is 1 over 2400 as opposed to 1 over 1200. So our frequencies are now 4800 and 2400 hertz. Those are both within the frequency bandwidth of a typical portable cassette player. So you might think this should work. Um, so this is actually very, very easy to try. Come over here to the code real quick. I have a equate called bit time. Originally at 1200 baud, the bit time was 832 microseconds. All I had to do is drop that in half to 416 microseconds, and now we're running at 2400 baud. I went ahead and ran this, and it worked great. No problems, the reliability seemed very, very good. So pretty easy step to get us to 2400. So I figured, well, let's go for broke. Let's take this 416, divide it in half, make it 208. Then I'm at 4,800 baud. Uh, the frequencies, of course, at that point are 9,600 hertz and 4,800 hertz being written to tape. And that didn't work well at all. I mean, it, you could tell it was responding to the data on the tape, but it was just garbage that would come out instead. 
Um, why? Well, because 9600 baud is starting to reach uh, or is hitting the upper limits of the frequency response range of a typical portable cassette recorder. And this is one that had a tone control, which I had put all the way up to maximum treble to help boost those high ends. But we're not going to get 4800 just with this simple FM modulation that you see here. So somewhere between 24 and 4800 is our limit. So the question then becomes, how could we get um, more baud rate out of this with some other technique? And that's when we start taking a look at uh, what's called MFM, Modified Frequency Modulation, which is the technique that floppy disks used to go from single density to double density. And let's take a look at that next. With MFM, we can double the baud rate while still keeping the bit density on the tape the same. What that means is that we can use the 4800 hertz frequency, which is the high frequency of our 2400 baud, and with that same maximum frequency of 4800, now we can get 4800 baud. Let's see how that works. So here's a sequence of ones encoded with MFM. We have a bit transition in the middle of the bit cell. These are at 4800 hertz, so that's 4800 baud. We're getting a one at 4800 hertz. If it's a zero, then we're getting a bit transition at the start of the cell. Again, this is 4800 hertz, so we're getting a new bit of zero at 4800 baud. So we've doubled the bit rate while still maintaining a maximum frequency of 4800 baud that we had, excuse me, at 4800 hertz that we had for our 2400 baud FM encoding. Now there's a special case that we have to worry about, and that's the transition from one to zero. Take a look at that here. So here's our pulses in the middle for the one. Now, the definition of zero is the pulses at the beginning, but that would put a pulse right here, at which point these two are at 9600 hertz, which we can't do. We have to stay 4800 hertz or below. So when transitioning from one to zero, we skip this leading pulse on the zero. Now another way of looking at this is that there's a pulse in the middle for a one, there is no pulse in the middle for a zero. So in that case, you can see we have no pulse here in the middle, so that's a zero. And then from then on, you do put the leading edge on the zero, which of course now we're back at our 4800 hertz. This was a slightly longer period between it, not faster. All right, so that's how MFM can double our data rate while still keeping our max frequency to the tape at 4800 hertz. So I went ahead and gave this a whirl and it sort of worked. Um, probably 75% of the characters were right and 25% of them were, were wrong. And I couldn't tweak anything or make that any better. That was just the way it was, which doesn't quite make sense. If, if FM worked fine with 4800 and 2400 hertz, this has a max frequency of 4800 and lower frequencies. Why does it not work? Well, it's a little bit confusing, but let's take a look at this. The same problem occurred with disk drives. Even though the maximum frequency is the same, the amount of uh, slop or variation in bit timing, you have a 50% smaller window with MFM than you do with FM. So let's take a look at FM. Um, T is this period that I've arbitrarily chosen. It's basically one fourth the bit time in FM. Because in FM, the bit time you get 4T is the period from here to here. When you have a 1, then you can see there's a 2T period between here. So in other words, we have 2T of slop that this thing could move left or right a little bit, and we could still catch. Um, now in MFM, again, the fastest frequency is still 2T, but the possibilities between two pulses are 2T, 3T, or 4T. So in other words, our window of positioning of these pulses has to be accurate within 1t now as opposed to 2t. So we have half of the uh, tolerance for jitter and variation in that bit position. And that is where the problems come in. The wow and flutter specs of your disk drive start to take effect. And also the, uh, the zero point of the MFM does not average zero volts. Um, and that's because it's not a symmetrical waveform. That in turn means that this waveform is moving up and down a bit around zero, which is changing zero processing. That in turn translates into jitter in this uh, bit position of this pulse. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to double us up to 4800 baud by using MFM after all, because of this tighter tolerance in detecting the bit positions 
That is half the amount of room you have back on FM. All right, that doesn't mean we couldn't have gotten working at 3,000 baud or 3,600 baud, some other limit where we still have an acceptable rate, bit rate error. Uh, but that's not a standard rate on the serial interface board, so I didn't, I didn't really want to mess with that. All right, so it looks like the best we're going to get out of this without more major modification is 2,400 baud using a uh, portable cassette recorder. So let's go ahead and uh, do a quick demo of that and see what that's like. So as in the last video, we're going to go ahead and boot Altair's 8K Basic from cassette. And to get that going, we're going to use the uh, Altair multi-boot loader prom. That's at FE00. Examine that. It sets the run address. These first four switches, we'll set it to a value of 1. That tells Basic to use a 2SIO serial port for a console. The next four switches, we'll set that to a value of 3. That tells the checksum loader to use a... Uh, the cassette interface for loading basic. At this point we're ready to run. So I'll let the tape go and hit run. Let me go ahead and start that timer up there running so we see how long this takes. Of course um, we did this before at 1200 baud and it took about uh, a minute and 10 seconds. The original Altair cassette would have taken about four minutes and 50 seconds to get this loaded. We'll go to 2400 baud. We should expect this to be done in about 35 seconds or so. So 35 seconds compared to 4 minutes and 50 seconds is quite an improvement. We'll know this is done as soon as we see this light pattern here change and you'll see it pop up over there. All right, it's done. Took under 35 seconds. So that's pretty quick and easy way to boot. Let's go over here to the screen. See what we got here. So there's the memory size prompt. I can go ahead and just hit return here. Terminal width, want sine, cosine. All right, we're up and running in basic. Simple as that. All right, we can use the cassette to load a program. Let's load the craps program like we loaded last time. Go ahead and hit the tape run, hit return. It's the next item on tape. Uh, this took about a minute and 20 seconds with the original Altair cassette. Here at 2400 baud, this should take barely 10 seconds or so. And then we'll be up and running, ready to play our game. There we go. So nice and fast, uh, 2400 baud again, eight times faster than the original cassette interface. So this is, a, this is a pretty nice setup, but it does seem that 2400 baud is gonna be about the limit that we can achieve with this. Um, so what limits did they actually run into and encounter back in the day? So processor technology, their cuts board and the SOL 20, which uses the exact same cassette uh, logic, cassette interface logic, uh, they had it set for 1200 baud, but on the cuts board in the manual and on the board, you can tell they planned on using it at higher rates, uh, 2400, 4800. But in the end, it was never really reliable for them based on the number of different cassette recorders and things that people might actually have in the field. So they recommend the 1200 baud setting. Now, the fastest of the day that came out a bit later than processor technology was the Tarbell cassette interface. Um, it advertised 187 bytes per second as a throughput. Now, they did not use asynchronous. They were synchronous, so 8 bits per byte instead of 10. Um, so they were effectively running at 1500 baud uh, instead of the 1200. Now, again, they could get faster than that on numerous cassette players, but they recommended the 187 characters or the 1500 baud as the maximum rate that you should use if you wanted to have a chance of interchanging tapes with somebody else, for example. Now here, I'm quite reliable at 2400. I've tried it on three different little cassette recorders and it's worked fine on all of them. Of course, that's not an exhaustive sample by any means, but um, it could be that I have more leeway in errors because it is a piece of firmware running in that processor and it allows me to pick up the absolute maximum range of uh, drift in those bits. For example, I can go the full plus or minus one bit that we saw on the other side. And, you know, just a, it's a decision line halfway between uh, zero and one, so to speak. And so that really is probably a bit larger than the analog hardware uh, and digital hardware combo they use could have done uh, without the logic of a processor. But then again, I'm essentially doing an input capture of, of rising edges or rising and falling. If you wanted to do that, if you're making one back then, you might have tried a counter technique to do something similar to what we were doing here. But um, of course, again, like many times when we work on this stuff, hindsight's 2020, we have a lot of experience that people developing in that time wouldn't have had the 
exposure or the time to go out and chase down like we are doing it. This is our, our leisure pastime activity. So we've got all sorts of time, but it's been lots of fun. Um, I may turn around and try it on a, a higher fidelity tape deck at some point like that reel to reel back there. I'd need to make a, an interface to get the right volume levels out of that back to the cassette interface board, but it might be fun to see how fast I can get it to work with something that's higher fidelity like that reel to reel deck. All right, that does it for this video.